Hey, Sister Peaches. How are you? So good to see you. You helped calm my nerves. I had a hard time getting on here today. So thank you for being here. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hey, family. I know we're coming on a few minutes late, so y'all might have thought we weren't coming, but we're here. We're here. We're here. I'm good, Sister Peaches. Hey, Sister Mary Frazier, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hello to those who are watching via the link and they can't comment. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, Nana. Sister Vivian, good to see you. I know you're always on faithfully. We're getting ready to dive in these uh Tech challenges sometimes take me, take me a little. <laughs> Woo, but we're here. Thank the Lord. We are here. We are here. We are here. So great to be with you all. I know you were probably expecting Elder Patrick as he has been walking us through a study on understanding, studying and understanding the Old Testament. And we are in no ways done with that study, but he had a, a conflict for tonight. And so, hey, Sister Barbara Winkler, Barbara Winkler's here. We could get started, y'all. Um, Elder Patrick had a conflict for tonight. And so he asked if I could um, cover for tonight. And so we're going to do just that, but we're going to stay. I don't want to take us far afield from talking about the Old Testament. So today, tonight, we're actually going to look at um, Jesus's approach to the Old Testament. We're going to look at Jesus's approach to the Old Testament. And so I'm going to share um, some thoughts and we're going to look at some, some scriptures in the New Testament and some scriptures in the Old Testament. The bulk of the scriptures, because I have a lot of scripture references for you today. So the bulk of them, I am going to just reference. Um, and you can feel free to jot them down. And then there will be some that I, I'll read. I got my, my paper Bible and everything. I'm paper Bible saved tonight. Um, there will be some that we will read um, as we um, approach understanding Jesus's approach um, to the Old Testament. We're going to pray. Um, my heart is encouraged by seeing you all coming on. Um, I always fear that when I, if I'm late, I've, I've lost everyone. So glad to see you all here. Um, definitely keep the Fraser family in your prayer. Lost your sister, son, Tony. Oh my goodness. I am so so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. We will definitely, definitely be putting you, keeping you in our prayers. We'll um, share that with our prayer ministry as well, Sister Mary, and ask them to be praying. Um, so many dealing with so much grief and loss, and we will certainly join you um, in praying for your, your family in this time of your loss. Let's pray now. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you this evening, God, we are thankful, Lord thankful for this point of connection, Father, this point of agreement, for we believe that there is great power in the place of agreement. And as we have uh, uh, joined ourselves together in this time to seek your face, Lord, to, to love you by, by learning your word, that we may learn of you and learn of your heart. We thank you, God, that you will meet us in this place. We thank you, Lord God, for the ability that you give us even to comfort and strengthen and build one another up. And so, Father, I pray for everyone that is logged on and everyone who is going to log on and everybody that's going to catch this in the replay. Lord God, I pray for them now in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to them that you will reveal yourself to us. God, may we walk away from this time understanding your heart a little bit better and falling a little bit more in love with who you are. We pray today, Lord God, for Sister uh, Mary Frazier and her family. I pray, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, that you would be for them the comforter that you have been for me and that you have been for so many others, Lord. God, in these times, we often don't know what to say and don't know what to do 
do for death can take us uh, uh, so unaware, God, and catch us by surprise, Lord God. God, we can, uh, 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 it can take our breath away, Lord God. But I pray, Father, that in the midst of this time of breathlessness and heaviness and, and mournfulness and sorrow, Lord God, that you would grant them the comfort of your Holy Spirit. God, that they would know that you are near, that you are just as near in the midst of the tears as you are in the midst of their joy and their laughter. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them as comforter, Lord God. Reveal yourself as the one who strengthens us in our weaknesses, God. I pray, God, even that you would reveal yourself as the one with whom it's okay to grieve, Lord. Let them know that they don't have to try to hold it together, that it's okay to fall apart on you, that, that you can handle, Lord God, their unknowing. You can handle them being undone, Father. You can handle their anger. You can handle, oh God, their, their sadness, Lord God. You can handle their confusion, their questions, their fears, God. You can handle it all. Your arms are strong and you are well able. And so I I pray for them today in the name of Jesus. I pray that those that don't, that those that know you, oh God, will come to know you in a deeper way and that those that don't know you will come to know you, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, that you can be trusted to walk with us. Lord, for you're not the shepherd that sends us into the valley of the shadow of death, but you are the shepherd that walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And even in that valley, your goodness and your mercy See, hallelujah. Even in that valley, your goodness and your mercy pursue us. And so I pray that your goodness and your mercy would pursue the Frazier family, God, that your goodness and your mercy would pursue the Williams family as they prepare to funeralize God. Uh, Sister Brianna, God prepares to funeralize her brother tomorrow. I pray that your goodness and your mercy would pursue the Thomas family, God, as, as Pastor Carolyn and Sister Danielle prepare to funeralize their brother tomorrow. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that they would be able to look back on this time and say, that time was hard, but I saw the goodness of God. I saw the faithfulness of God, even in the midst of the hard time, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God, even for the the comfort that we are able to lend to one another. God, the words of encouragement, God, the embraces, the smiles, the meals, the text messages that I'm thinking of you and praying for you, the, the scriptures, Lord God, sent by text message, the cards in the mail, the drive-by visits, God, all the, the ways that you enable us, God, the, the sitting in silence while we just cry, Lord God, the ways that you enable us, Lord God, to comfort and strengthen one another. God, I pray that none of those that we have named, Lord God, would, would, would feel that they have to uh, grieve alone, Lord God, but, but that we would be willing, God, and they would be willing to allow us to sit with them, Lord, like Job's friends who sat with him in silence for seven days because his grief was so great. God, even if all we can do is sit with them as they cry, Lord God, you tell us to bear one another's burdens, oh God. And so I thank you for gracing us to bear one another's burdens. I pray today that you would speak to us through your word, Father. Reveal your heart, Lord God, and it will satisfy us. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're talking about tonight Jesus and the Old Testament. We're talking about Jesus and uh, my screen just did something crazy. I thought I might have lost y'all. Jesus and the Old Testament. Jesus's approach. Somebody put that in the comments for me. Jesus's approach to the Old Testament. Now, I know that's an interesting statement because the Old Testament was all that Jesus had. <laughs> Right. It's not like he had an Old Testament and a New Testament. And he could say, you know, I really prefer the New Testament because those stories in the Old Testament are kind of scary or they're kind of strange. Right. The Old Testament was what he had. But I think it's important uh, for us to understand. Hey, Elderberry. 
us to understand how Jesus, who has been referred to as the hinge of all of history, how he approached, hey, Sister Connie, how he approached the scripture, how he approached the law and the prophet and the sayings, as it was often referred to in his time, the law and the prophet and the sayings. Um, how exactly did he demonstrate? Uh, what did he demonstrate for us as it relates to interacting with the scripture? So I'm going to ask you all um, to, 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 um, to talk to me for a minute. So when you think about Jesus um, in the New Testament, can you think of a time that Jesus mentions the Old Testament in his teaching or preaching? If so, just drop it in the comment. Can you think of a time that Jesus mentions the Old Testament in his preaching and teaching. This requires patience because I got to wait for y'all to think and type it in and the comments to load up. Can you think of a time that Jesus mentions the Old Testament in his preaching and teaching? Anyone? Anyone? Actually, Jesus quotes the Old Testament very often. When you read in the New Testament, um, I only remember parables and such, and we'll, we'll touch on that, parables and such. One of the parables that Jesus gives, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the lead-in to the parable of the Good Samaritan is actually a reference to the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about that a little in a, in a little bit um, in that, that Luke 10 parable. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but Jesus actually quotes the Old Testament quite often. He references God's creation. He references, you were close, Dr. Mary. He references Adam and Eve. He references Cain's murder of Abel, Noah's Ark. God's judgment on the world by a flood. He references Abraham and Lot, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. He references Lot, Lot's wife being turned to salt. He references Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God speaking to Moses in the burning bush. God feeding Israel with manna in the wilderness. He references Moses writing the book of Genesis. Um, Moses holding up the brass serpent and healing the believers of snake bites. He references David as the author of Psalms over and over and over again. Jesus is actually referencing in his preaching, in his teaching, and sometimes in justifying his actions, he is pointing to the Old Testament. He talks about God delivering Jonah from the great fish. He talks about the rule of Solomon and he talks about Elijah and Elisha's miracles um, over and over. So actually Jesus quotes from 14 books in the Old Testament doing, during his ministry. But specifically, and Jesus he Jesus preaches and teaches using the Old Testament in some specific ways. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to look at like some of those categories of how Jesus approaches the Old Testament. First of all, I think it's important for us to understand that Jesus valued the Old Testament. Again, I'm saying Jesus valued the Old Testament with the understanding that the Old Testament was what it was, right? It's not like he was like, you know. 
know, I like Isaiah, but Ephesians is really popping. You know, I like Jeremiah, but, you know, Hebrews is really where it's at. Like that was what he had. Like that was that was what was existing. That was that was what was taught in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and really more more so in his home and in synagogue. Right. That that um, the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the saints and Jesus, we see even from a young age, his value of the scripture. You are remember when um, uh, 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 Jesus is, he's like 12 years old and his family has gone to Jerusalem, like for one of the holy days and they're on the way back home. And Mary is like, Joseph, we're Jesus. And Joseph is like, what you mean we're Jesus? I thought he was with you. And she's like, I thought you was watching my son. See, that's why I can't. All that didn't really happen in the Bible. I was just, I'm adding it because I figure it probably wasn't as calm as, you know, Luke writes it, but you know, they, they figure they, they, you know, can't find Jesus and he's not with none of the cousins and he's not hanging out with John and like, they can't find them. And they go all the way back, retrace their steps and go back and find them. And the scripture says that he's, he in the synagogue, chopping it up with the religious people talking about the word of God. Like that's what he's doing at 12 years old. So from young, Jesus was taught to value the scripture from a young age. And when we see Jesus again, he's entering into his public ministry, right? And you, we know that he comes down to the Jordan to be baptized by John. I know some of y'all, y'all hopefully can track some of this narrative. He comes down to be baptized by John. And after he's baptized by John, the scripture says he's led in, right? He's in his father's house. That's what he said. Didn't you think I was going to be about my father's business? Sound a little fresh, Jesus. You've been a little fresh with your mouth, but you know, it was Jesus. So apparently it wasn't fresh with the mouth. Um, but after his baptism, the scripture says he's led into the, the wilderness and he's tempted where he's tempted of the devil for 40 days. But what happens when he's in the wilderness? The enemy comes to him with all of these temptations. And we find this in Luke chapter four. I'm going to read a little bit of it. When the enemy is coming to Jesus with all of these temptations, the first temptation, he says, um, if you are the son of God, this is Luke chapter four. If you are the son of God, verse uh, three, then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Well, where did Jesus get that from? Like, was it a song? Did he hear his grandfather and them talking about that coming up? No, he's actually quoting Old Testament scripture. The scripture says, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. I'm in Luke chapter four, beginning at verse three, verse nine says, then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. But the scriptures say that he will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. So what's happening in this in this 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 passage? A couple of things. First of all, the enemy is trying to use the scripture, but he's trying to use it inaccurately. This is why the study that Elder Patrick is doing is so wonderful, because we have to learn how how to rightly divide the word of truth, not just how to take the Bible and throw scriptures, fling scriptures here and there, but how do we appropriately understand so that we can appropriately apply the word of God to our lives? How do we appropriately understand 
so that we can appropriately apply the word of God to our lives. The devil was saying the scriptures say, but Jesus is saying, nah, you trying to take that out of context in order to jam me up and get me to do, allow me to do what my flesh wants. But that's not what's about to go down right here. So Jesus uses the scripture as a weapon against temptation. I wonder if any of us have ever done that, have ever been in a place of temptation, that place where the enemy is trying to whisper to us, trying to say things that might sound good to our flesh, but we know are not truthful and are not honoring of God. He's trying to whisper those things to us. I wonder if we ever in those moments take the word of the Lord. That's what the Bible says when it talks about the armor of God, when it talks about in the book of Ephesians, the armor of God. It says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I wonder if we ever take the word of God and use the word of God against the suggestions of the enemy as Jesus is doing here in Luke chapter four. So we see in through Jesus example that Jesus valued the scripture that he uses in Luke chapter four, the Old Testament, which was the only scripture that he has as a weapon. He uses it to do war with the suggestions of the adversary that in, in the, and thereby he is enabled to stand, right? And to be faithful in the midst of temptation. The other way in which we see Jesus interacting with the Old Testament is that Jesus himself embodies, he embodies or he is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Look at what happens later on in Luke chapter four. I love this passage of scripture and Elder Patrick who will be back with you next week. I think this, this is a big one for him too because this is a big social justice scripture. But Luke chapter four, Verse 16. So now Jesus has been baptized. You know, he survived, he survived, um, you know, dipping off from his parents and they, they let him live to grow up. He's been baptized, right? Announcing um, kind of the him going public, if you will. He's been led by the spirit into the wilderness for a time of prayer and fasting for 40 days where he's tempted of the devil and he Brings out his he brings out his sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and does battle with the enemy. And the scripture says the devil finished when the devil finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. So that means it wasn't the last time that he was he was um, tempted. And then what happens next? Jesus announces his entry into public ministry. But look at what how he announces it. The scripture says that Jesus returns to Galilee. He's filled with the power power of the Holy Spirit. Reports about him start spreading quickly through the region and he begins to teach regularly in the synagogue and the people like what he has to say like yo he got some word like I, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm really feeling what he's saying like that really resonates that really resonates. Then he comes to the village of, of Nazareth his childhood home. And as is usually his custom, he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stands up to read the scriptures. So they were hand, they handed him the scripture and the scroll, kind of like the reading for the day was the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Check this out. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant and sat down. Now, everybody is looking at him like, how is he going to break this down? Because this is what we do. We read the scripture and then we talk about what it means. We read the scripture and then we talk about how does it appropriately apply to our lives, right? So Jesus sits down and he says, check it. The scripture that I just read from the book of Isaiah, y'all know the prophet Isaiah, the scripture that I just read is being fulfilled today. Right now, right here, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. 
And everyone was so excited and amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? Look at what Jesus is doing. He uses the Old Testament to announce his entry into ministry. Now it gets a little, it gets a little funky after this because they were clapping for him for a moment, right? They were excited for a moment. And then he was like, basically, y'all not ready for this. Y'all not ready for this because a prophet is not honored, is honored everywhere else except in his own hometown. Everybody else think the prophet is the mom except the, the people from where he's from, Right? Jesus uses the Old Testament book of Isaiah, which he actually quotes quite often during the course of his earthly ministry. He uses the book of Isaiah as his public announcement. And he says, yo, that's me, son. That's me. That's me. That Isaiah, that who he was talking about, that's me. So he not only values the Old Testament, he not only uses the scripture or the Old Testament as a weapon, but he himself is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He uses Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which is where the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Those exact words appear in Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, which was hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene, before Jesus in the flesh came on the scene. He himself is the fulfillment of the Old, Old Testament prophecy. He also talks about this in um, a little bit later. He says, um, uh, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings or the prophets. I didn't come to push all that stuff aside. I didn't come to tear it up or to nullify it. I came to accomplish their purpose. I came to accomplish the purpose of the law, the purpose of the writings, the purpose of the prophets. So the law, the first five books, the writings are the Psalms and the Proverbs and the prophets are the prophetic books, the Isaiah Isaiah's, the Jeremiah's, the Nahum, the Amos. I'm sure Elder Patrick, Elder Patrick has already broken that down for us in the first session, which is on genre. He says, I came to accomplish the purpose of the law. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Now here's the tension. Because on one hand, Jesus is saying, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill his purpose. But on the other hand, he always doing something unlawful. The religious people are like clutching their pearls. Because Jesus is doing stuff like healing people on the Sabbath, walking through fields, breaking off grain, eating grain on the Sabbath, talking to women in public, talking to, to, to disreputable women, letting, letting this, this disreputable woman cry on your feet. And why that's a little, that's a little scandalous. That's a little salacious. That's a little bit lot, Jesus. Like he's always doing these things, keeping company with sinners, the worst kind of sinners. If you think about who the whoever comes to mind for you, if you heard the worst kind of sinners today, whoever that person is, whatever type of people they are, those are probably the people that Jesus would have been hanging out with. The scripture says tax collectors and sinners. But that means people that people I'm a, can I just keep it real honest. I don't know if we allowed to do non children's church messaging on Facebook Live. Pastor Carolyn will text me and rebuke me if I'm inappropriate. But but when, but when when the scripture talks about tax collectors and sinners, that doesn't mean a lot to us. Let me put it in a way that we can understand it. Jesus always hanging out with people that's messing around financially and sexually. Doing stuff with people's money and doing stuff with people's bodies that they shouldn't be doing. That's who Jesus was always hanging with. That's who he was like, hey, I want to come have you over for dinner. And this is the same man that's saying I didn't come to abolish the law, to set aside the law. I came to fulfill the law. Here's the tension that the religious power brokers have with Jesus. Like, which one is it, man? 
But we see in scripture, Jesus honoring the law. Remember in Luke 5, Luke 5, 14, he instructs the, 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 the lepers. Let me, let me, he heals a man with leprosy. And then 514, it says Jesus, and then Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. So wait a minute. This is Jesus honoring the law. Because those instructions that he gives to the leper in Luke 5, 14, those instructions are snatched right out of Leviticus 14. Concerning the cleansing of lepers and the role of the priest in the cleansing of the leper. Elder Barry referenced it earlier, Luke 10, 27, another example of Jesus honoring the law, Jesus honoring the Old Testament. When the expert in religious law comes to Jesus and says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Because that was what they engaged in. The experts in religious law, they went back and forth about how different people thought about different things written in the law. The expert in religious law says he quote the expert quotes from Deuteronomy 6 and 5 and from Leviticus 19 and 18. Love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yes, right, cool, do that. We're talking about Jesus's relationship with the Old Testament. He says, yes, right, cool, do that and you shall live. But you know how the story goes on. The expert wanting to justify himself says, all right, but who's my neighbor? And then Jesus gives him the, the parable of the good Samaritan. Jesus values the scripture. He uses the scripture, which for him was the Old Testament. That was all he had, right? The, um, the scripture as a weapon against the seductions of the enemy. He honored the law, but he also embodied or fulfilled the law. And believe it or not, as much as he irritated religious people, Jesus acted according to the, script, the teachings of scriptures. When he was questioned about why he was doing this thing or that thing, he often pointed to the Old Testament scripture. But you'll notice that when he's pointing to the Old Testament scripture, he's often doing so in a way to help people understand that they have been so attached to the letter of the law that they have lost sight of the spirit of the law. Can I give you an example? Jesus and his disciples, Jesus' disciples are walking through a field on the Sabbath and they get a little snacky. And so they break off some grain and just start snacking on it in the field. And folks get upset. The priests get upset because they are eating grain, not because the eating, but the breaking is considered work that should be abstained from. We should not be working according to the law on the Sabbath. So the priests, like they, they face off with Jesus, like, your disciples are really out here working on the Sabbath. And what does Jesus say? Jesus points them to the scripture. He points them to 1 Samuel 21. He says, y'all remember that time when David was running from Saul? And when he got around about Nob to Nob, they were hungry. David and his men were hungry and they asked the priest for something to eat. And the priests were like, we don't have any regular bread. All we got is the holy bread, the sacred bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And the priest gave David and his men the holy bread. Jesus is using the scripture to confirm the validity of what he's doing. 
again, showing his value for the word of God, showing his value for the Old Testament, that he didn't just throw it away. So here's a question, like if Jesus didn't just throw away the Old Testament, and if anyone ever had the right to throw it away, you would think it would be Jesus. If Jesus himself did not just discard the Old Testament, how much more if he valued it, if he held on to it, if he gleaned from it, how much more should we? Here's the last thing about Jesus in the Old Testament before I let you go. And this one kind of sort of messes me up. Because not only did Jesus value the Old Testament, not only did or the scripture, not only did he use the scripture as a weapon, did he embody it or, or and, and announce that he was the fulfillment of it? Not only did he honor it and act according to the teachings of scripture, but he also, as it relates to the law and the Old Testament, he expanded on the Old Testament truths in his teaching. This is the last part that we're going to read. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter chapter five. It's really chapters five through seven, but I'm not going to read two chapters on these internets. All right. I'm going to start at verse 21, math in Matthew chapter five, verse 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. That seems pretty reasonable, right? <laughs> That's from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 in Deuteronomy 5, 17. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. All right. He said, but I say, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, I think in the King James Version, it says Raka. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Whoa, Jesus, 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 Jesus. The Old Testament was just about killing somebody. I ain't kill nobody physically. Jesus said, yeah, the letter of the law is not as about not killing them physically. But I'm praising a greater commandment. I don't even want you to kill them spiritually. Lord Jesus. Lord, that's a lot. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Not you got something against somebody, but you know they beefing with you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. He said, and it's not enough. Like I know the Old Testament was like, don't be out here killing folks. But I want to take you a little deeper than that. Don't be out here destroying their reputation. Don't be out here cursing their future. Woo, Lord have mercy. You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. Where is that? That's in the Ten Commandments. We are, we had thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, but I say, Jesus said, these are the words of Christ in red. Y'all see that? <laughs> but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off. 
and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus said, listen, y'all worried about whether you actually did the act. I need you to go deeper than that. I need you to go deep. The law says don't commit adultery, but I need you to go deeper than the physical act. I need you to guard your heart. I need you to guard your eyes. I need you to get rid of the things in your life that would even lead you down that path. So Jesus is not just saying like, here's the law, do it. He's like, no, you got to do more than that. You have heard the law say a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorcement. Or divorce, sorry, that's the King James meant. Written notes of divorce. But I say a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Jesus said the, the law, you heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife, just give her a notice and send her on. Even if you just send her on because she just burnt dinner and you, you don't like the way she cooked no more. Jesus said, no, 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 no. You got to go deeper than that. You got to go deeper than that. You've heard it said, your ancestors say, you must not break your vows. You must not, you must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, don't even make any vows. Don't, don't swear by heaven because heaven is God's throne. Don't swear by earth because that's his footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Don't even swear by your own head because you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say, yes, I will or no, I won't. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Your yay be yay and your nay be nay. So Jesus is taking these laws that people might have pride in. Woo! Can, can we can we be honest? Say we we can have pride in the fact that we don't do that no more. I ain't like them. I don't do that. We can have pride in that. And the Holy Spirit be like, ooh, but your heart ugly. Ooh. I ain't cur I ain't cursed them out. Not out your mouth, but you cursed them out in your head and in your heart. Jesus doesn't just lift up the law. He points us to what the law is supposed to be pointing us to. Not just restraining us from ungodliness, but cultivating godliness. Not just restraining us from ungodliness. <coughs> Excuse me but cultivating godliness. He enlarges the meaning, showing that these things are not just rules to obey, but principles that will change our lives if we let them. So Jesus valued the scripture used it as a weapon against the seductions of the adversary, embodies or fulfills the Old Testament, honors the law, acted according to the teachings of scripture, but also saw that it was necessary to use the word and the intention of the word to cultivate godliness. To cultivate godliness. And so he's pushing. He's pushing. Anybody on here been saved for a little while and you like, dang, like I, I've been saved for 20 years. And still the Lord is like asking me for more, right? He's still cultivating. He's convicting me of things that, that you know, I'm, I'm proud, prideful that I ain't doing these things. But then he got this whole other list of things that he is, he is convicting me of. Why? Because the ultimate aim of scripture is not to be like a, 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 a bat or a rod to beat us over our heads, right? 
but to be an open doorway so that we may experience intimate fellowship, oneness with God, so that we might look like him, understand his heart, and move like him. This last example, and I'm going. So in the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar, Xerxes, Old Testament kings. When they would go into a territory and subdue a territory, one of the things that they would do is have carvings or statutes of themselves placed in places that they had conquered. And the purpose of that was to remind the people that like, I'm far away, but I rule here. So they would have carvings of themselves, statues carved and placed in all of the faraway places to remind people that I'm far away, but I rule here. What if the word of God is how God carves us and shapes us into his image to place at the Trenton Board of Education, to place at Trenton Psych, to place at the Mount Holly Athletic Association, to place at the APA to place at the College of New Jersey as a reminder that he's far away, but he still rules here. What if the purpose of the word of God is not that we would love the word, but that we would love the one whose breath the word is. For all scripture is God breathed. That's it and that's all y'all. Questions. Comments, prophetic utterances before we close. Elder Patrick is going to be back. And in the next two weeks, he will continue to carry us through understanding, applying the Old Testament. We do this not just as an intellectual exercise, but that we may know him. That we may know him. That we may know him. And that we may fall more and more in love with him. Hey, Pastor Didi. Father, we thank you for the invitation to know you even as we are known by you. Knowing you requires patience in a time where we often want a quick answer, a quick word, fast spiritual food. You are inviting us through this series of studies to sit down and to make a home-cooked meal, to take our time and to be immersed in your word that we may be immersed in your heart. So many things compete for our attention and our affection and we continue to push true engagement with your word to the back burner. We leave it for the professionals, the professionals on Bible study night, Sunday service, 
to break it down for us. But I pray, Father, that you would stir in us through this study a curiosity, a hunger that causes us to move from milk and snacks to the meat of your word. Therein we would find you and find you glorious. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right, y'all. I love you all with the love of the Lord, which is so much better than mine. Have a great evening. If you haven't gotten into your word all week, don't wait till Monday. Get in there again tonight. Get in there tomorrow morning. Let the word of God nourish you. Let the word of God free you. Let the word of God satisfy you. Love you all. God bless. Hey, Minister Tina, I didn't know you weren't here. And congratulations, Minister Tina got her second paper published. Good night, everyone. Love y'all.